well over there in the social hall. I appreciate being here with you. Actually, I really enjoy worshiping in the Episcopalian service this morning. I thought we should steal over to the early services a little bit more often. I'll be glad I had James. <laughs> oh, well, you know, we had a big election this week. And I thought, in light of this recent election, this morning's lectionary readings felt particularly relevant to me, especially the one from the Gospel reading in Mark 12. So in that Gospel reading that we just heard James read aloud here, there were two elements. First, we saw Jesus' warning. Right? He says, beware of the scribes. And he said, beware of them. They like to walk around in long robes. They like to be greeted with respect. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And so you've got his warning, and then second, he shows us the poor widow. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and he's watching everybody come and get all of their money, and then the poor widow who gives her two little copper coins, and he says that she, out of her poverty, has put in everything that she has, all that she had to live on. But I think there's actually a third element to this story that is after what we read this morning. So we read this bit from the, the Gospel of Matthew, and then immediately after that, there's the announcement of the temple's impending destruction. So Mark goes on to say this. He says, as Jesus came out of the temple, this is right after he's been sitting there talking about the widow, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, we've got such large stones and such large buildings. And then Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. They will all be thrown down. So I think each one of these three elements, you could, you could have, um, you could build a sermon around them. But when you put them together, I think that there is a coherence that sometimes we can miss. So first of all, the scribes. Jesus tells his audience to beware of them. Who are they? Probably many of us grew up with this story, and you know, like, okay, well, those are the political and the religious teachers and leaders who carried a lot of influence. They were generally respected. And it's worth remembering that this isn't, you know, Jesus the Christian who is criticizing a Jewish system. This is Jesus the Jewish man who is critiquing from within his own tradition. And so in the same way, I see a lot of validity in us Christians critiquing our own Christian leaders and our own systems. So I relate these scribes that Jesus is describing to the Christian leaders that I know, who love to command attention and influence and who use their platform to prop up unjust systems. And I think I can say, having been kicked out of the evangelical ilk, I can maybe be a little blunter and say some from my own former tribe would be among those people like a Franklin Graham. It's a bit like today's politicians. And Jesus has some harsh words for these leaders. And there's essentially two major critiques that he is giving. The first is that they focus a lot on external signs of wealth and of prestige. Right? They're wearing their long robes. They want the best seats. They want the place of honor. They're driven by their egos. But the second critique, I think, is actually worse than the first. Jesus says they devour widows' houses. Now, there's some debate about what this means, but a plausible option goes like this. Women had very little social power in that time and place. And to be a widow meant that you had even less power. So if you were a widow and you were fortunate enough to be married um, with some property with your husband, once he died, you were not permitted to own that property. So the scribes, the religious and political leaders, they created a system in which they became the trustees of the widow's estate because the widows couldn't own anything. So these women, they could still live in their homes, but the houses weren't really their houses anymore. And so then to manage the estates of the various widows, the scribes charged money, right? They charged a portion of what the estate was worth. So every year the widows would give to these scribes a portion of their homes worth their value because the scribes supposedly were helping them manage their own homes. Now, on one hand, I was thinking, you know, this actually, it's a more just system. 
system than allowing the women to go homeless, than allowing the widows to be kicked out of their homes. But Jesus is critiquing it. He's saying, I think the system is corrupt. And it seems to be because he thinks these scribes are using that money to have nice banquets and to live lives of luxury and influence. So that's what Jesus is critiquing. He's saying, look, widows are being taken advantage of. Their houses are literally being devoured just so these leaders can look good. And Jesus says, behold these scribes, these politicians. Behold your leaders, your rulers. Watch out. Right? It's like maybe a televangelist who's taking advantage of the elderly or the people who are very sick at home, telling them, you know, if they give their money lavishly, that God will bless them or heal them or whatnot. Beware. <coughs> so after this sobering warning, Jesus sits down in the temple, right near the treasury drop box where people place their offerings. Right? So you guys pass a plate each Sunday. Right? It would be like if Jesus was just following the ushers along, looking over the plate to see what everybody's putting in. That's a little awkward. I know many of our congregants um, give online at Blue Ocean. I think probably some of you do as well. But there was no system like that in Jesus' time. Right? It's all physical metal currency. And so people could go into the treasury and it was, you know, they'd bring their big heavy bags of silver and heavy and it would take them a long time to put it all in. It would make noise. Or else it would be like this would go. It was just the sound of two light little copper coins dropping in. So then Jesus calls his disciples and he says to them, he says, truly I tell you, this poor widow, she's put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. She out of her poverty has put in everything she had to live on. Now, there are two radically different interpretations of what Jesus is saying here. And I'm going to share them both with you because I think they both have some validity. And the first option, if you've been around churches long enough, as I have, is the one that I think most of us are probably familiar with. It's certainly the one I was. And that's that Jesus is holding up the widow as a model of sacrificial giving. Right? That this is a lesson in contrasts. So in contrast to the rich, who gave out of their abundance, this widow out of her poverty is giving. And the assumed motivation is that she's doing it as a very pious act. She's doing the best with what she has, and she's giving sacrificially to God, even to the point that it really costs her, right? And that's faith. And so then the takeaway is be like the widow. Give sacrificially to God, even if it costs you, because that's what faith is, and God will honor it. And then the expectation is that Jesus' disciples and the people who are hearing this story will continue to give sacrificially to God like that widow. How many of you guys have heard that, in, that interpretation before? Does that sound familiar? I mean, and it's beautiful. It's not a bad interpretation. But there's another one that I came across in a commentary that I was really struck by because it comes out of the liberation theology tradition. And it goes like this. It says that Jesus is actually offering a lament. Jesus is offering a lament. And in this reading, the poor widow is being taken advantage of by an unjust system. So in this way of thinking, Jesus is pointing the woman out, not as a model, but as a tragic figure. So it's a lesson about the degree to which this system oppresses the poor. And the evidence for this is that Jesus had just talked about how the scribes devoured widows' houses. And he used to say, man, beware of these people. They devour widows' houses. And by the way, look at that widow over there. This is an example of her oppression. She gives very little to a system over which she has no control. And over a system which Jesus goes on to announce immediately after will soon be destroyed. Right? So not stone, one stone will be left. He's saying many people are giving out of their abundance, but this poor woman, she's giving everything she has to a temple and to a system that is about to collapse, and that is tragic. The, ta the takeaway in this option is stop giving money to bad systems. And I think it's important to note that in this option, Jesus isn't blaming the widow for her participation. Right? He's not going over to her, he's talking to his disciples. 
Her participation is tragic, and Jesus wishes that it wasn't so. So instead, he calls the men around him, his close followers, the people with more societal power and agency, and he's calling his followers to not create and perpetuate bad systems. They're to build up systems that don't take advantage of the most vulnerable in society, right? They're to lift the downtrodden. They're to empower those who are most susceptible to being exploited. Okay, so just for fun here, let's look at how very different these two interpretive options are. In the first option, the emphasis is on the widow's commendable sacrificial giving. And it encourages people to do what they're told by the system, by the people who are most benefiting. In the second option, the widow is a tragic figure, and that encourages people, rather, to claim their agency and to become more discerning about what systems they support and about the kinds of systems that they choose to build. It's like Jesus is saying, disciples of mine, do not do this to people. As I said, I believe both interpretations are valid, and I think both have something to say to us. I think seeing Jesus in context, I, I think I actually lean toward the second interpretation, probably being a little bit closer to the Jesus that I follow. And this isn't to say that we shouldn't give sacrificially. I'm a pastor. I believe in church. I do. I tithe. My wife and I do. I encourage you to do that. I think that churches can be just a system. Yeah, I got, uh, I got an amen from James. <laughs> churches are just systems. And it's like what Nancy was talking about this morning when she shared about stewardship. You know, we are living out a witness that is countercultural, a witness that gives dignity to all humans. And in creating that, I think that is worth giving our time and our talents and our treasure to. I think it's beautiful and prophetic. But I would also encourage you to do what Jesus says, and that's beware of the scribes. Watch out for religious leaders and politicians and the unjust systems that take advantage of people, that use a veil of goodness and of righteousness to hide how the few are benefiting at the expense of others. And that leads us into the final part of the story, right? We have Jesus' warning. He talks about the widow. And then we're walking with Jesus, and we're leaving the temple. He came out of the temple, and one of Jesus' disciples said, Look, what large stones, what large buildings. And Jesus says, Not one stone will be left. All will be thrown down. You know, in my tradition, we might say, Jesus goes full prophet here. Right? He starts to use a lot of figurative, bold language, talking about the coming destruction of the temple. His disciples are like, this is amazing, and Jesus is just making them uncomfortable. This isn't going to last. And I don't think Jesus is saying this lightly. I don't think Jesus delights in destruction or in the suffering of his people. But he's being realistic about the natural consequences of building a system that oppresses people. See, it's untenable. It cannot and it will not last because it's not with God. So what do we do with this? I think simply Jesus is inviting us to build real, authentic community that recognizes and values the inherent dignity of every human person and that empowers every single one of us to claim the agency that God has given us. And I would say, in light of the recent election, we might also consider ourselves warned. Consider ourselves warned about the temporal nature of sick systems. Right? That's not a happy thought. We need to consider ourselves empowered to step into these creative alternatives of witnessing what life can be like. <clears throat> creative alternatives for economics, lest it all fall down around us. That witness will not stand. And as I worshipped with your fellow congregants at the first two services, I, I, I was really struck this week. We don't preach out of the lectionary in my tradition. We, re we read from the lectionary every week, but I don't necessarily preach on one of the, uh, the readings. And we were reading it, and I thought, you know, it's actually really interesting to me that they've placed the story of the widow and Elijah next to, or with, this widow here at the temple. And so I was actually I was thinking about this story and I was meditating on it a little bit here in First Kings and I thought, 
you know, if some like powerful prophet man or whatever came to me and I had no food and he asked me to give the last of what I had to him, when I had a kid that was going to starve, I would be mad. I mean, that is an unjust request. But the story, I think, is in there because it tells us that this actually was of God. And because it was of God, and God was trying to do justice to her by providing, that we can trust God. And I thought that's really interesting in contrast to this story about the temple. It's like if you put your trust in these unjust systems, they will fall. Every stone will come undone, but when we place our trust in God, God is trustworthy. Or as Psalm 146 said this morning, do not put your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in them. And we lift our eyes to the hills, whence cometh our help. Amen.